What's up everybody? This is Nick from Part-Time Pilot. Today's video we're going to talk about a tricky FAA written question for private pilot's license. Uh, I'm sure they use this question in other tests as well. Uh, so it's going to use our knowledge of a lot of different things. Uh, the wind side of our E6B, actually using that in reverse, knowing the relationships. The performance side of our E6B, and even the relationship of speed, time, and distance. So it's a tricky one. Uh, if you like how I break down these examples step by step, show you every single step, um, then we have a ton of stuff like this uh, in our online ground school. I try to make it so that every single topic, I have an example for every single thing they will see, students will see on the FAA written exam uh, so that nothing is left out one of the things that really annoyed me when I was going through flight training was when uh, they someone would leave out steps or they wouldn't have an example available and I was stuck searching the web uh, for hours and hours trying to find a solution. So uh, check out our ground school. Just go to parttimepilot.com uh, and then click on the courses. All right, but that's enough of that. Let's get to it. So here is the example. On a cross-country flight, point A is crossed at 1,500 hours. And the plan is to reach point B at 1530 hours, so a 30 minute flight. Uh, use the following information to determine the indicated airspeed required to reach point B on schedule at 1530 hours. All right, so they give us the distance between A and B of 70 nautical miles. They give us the forecasted winds, which because it's written and, not, uh, it's, and it doesn't say that it's magnetic, we can assume this is in terms of true direction of 310 degrees at 15 knots. It gives us a pressure altitude of 8,000 feet, temperature of minus 10 degrees Celsius, and a true course of 270. So this question tests us in many areas. It tests us the distance, time, and speed relationship. It tests the wind side of our E6B, and it tests the performance side of our E6B. Now, if you don't clearly see that we're gonna be using all these, don't worry. Um, I will show you how we get there. So when you have a tricky word problem like this, and this goes back even to in grade school when you had you know, those, those weird math problems that were like, if your friend has 100 apples and he gives 57 apples to you know, blah, blah, blah. So this is the same strategy that hopefully your teachers taught, taught you way back when, and that's to use the facts or the first principles and then build yourself a, a plan on how to get from what you have to what you need okay so what we have is here what we need is indicated airspeed okay and if you want more about how to use first principles and how to relate that to flight training that's one of the things I talk about it's the overarching thing I talk about in our our five uh, day mini course on uh, study hacks on how to get over procrastination and not having enough time for your ground training it's a free five day course just go to parttimepilot.com and go and click on the five step study hack um, if you want more information on that. So start with what we're given, the facts, the problems, the first principles, and then try to late, relate what is given to us to the relationships, procedures, and equations that we know so that we can build a step-by-step -step plan to get from what we know, the facts, to indicated airspeed. And then these steps in between are going to be our, our plan and, that we come up with, all right? So we're looking for indicated airspeed, right? Uh, we know we can use our E6B to go from true airspeed and indicated airspeed, okay? So now we're kind of working backwards. So if we can get true airspeed, true airspeed, then we can get to indicated airspeed. All we're gonna need is our pressure altitude and temperature to use that E6B. And then, so how do we get true airspeed though? We don't have true airspeed. Uh, we know that we can use true airspeed winds and course to get our ground speed, or we can use our ground speed winds and course to get our true airspeed using the wind side of our E6B. So we have the winds and we have the course, um, but we don't have a ground speed but what else do we have? Okay, so we have a distance, and oh, we also have a time. So we wanna do that in 30 minutes. So we have distance and time 
ground speed is just distance divided by time. So we know we can get ground speed. And then we know we can get to true airspeed. And then we know we can get to indicated airspeed. So we've now used the facts that was given to us in the problem, the relationships that we know from our ground studies, uh, to come up with a plan to get what we want. All right, so, uh, yep, so if we can just get ground speed, right, uh, then we can use it to get true airspeed using the wind study of 86B, and then with true airspeed, we can use temperature and pressure altitude on the performance side to get indicated airspeed. So first things first, we got to get ground speed, and we have enough information, right? We know crossing point A at 1500 and crossing point B at 1530, that's a 30 minute flight or half hour flight, and we're going to... In, we're going to travel 70 nautical miles. That's our plan. 70 nautical miles in a half hour. So that's enough information to calculate ground speed. Ground speed, like I said, is just distance divided by time. So 70 nautical miles divided by a half hour is 140 knots. So now we have ground speed. All right. So now that we have ground speed checked off, now we need a true airspeed. And we know that to get from true airspeed to ground speed or ground speed to true airspeed, that's the wind side of the E6B that does that for us, okay? And to use the wind side of the E6B, we need our forecast winds, our true course, and then our ground speed, and then the only thing missing is our true airspeed, all right? So we have enough information to do that, so let's do that. All right, so usually, all right, uh, we start with the true airspeed, winds, and true course, and then we end up with the grommet over our ground speed. Now we have a ground speed, course, and winds, uh, but we need true airspeed. So like I said, usually we set our wind velocity mark over the true airspeed. We slide this up and down and so that our wind velocity mark is on top of our true airspeed um, after we've spun the wheel to the true course. Okay, so uh, we put in our, we spin the true index to our, our winds. We mark our wind velocity on here, right? And then we spin this to our course and that spins our wind velocity mark. And then we move this up and down so that our wind velocity mark sits on top of our true airspeed on these scales. And then we just read off our ground speed under the grommet, okay? But since we have ground speed, we start with the grommet there, which takes care of the sliding step. So we won't need to slide this because we're already, we've already done our sliding. We already know where it needs to be slid to for the grommet to be over our ground speed. So now we just need to mark our wind velocity mark and see where it ends up when we have true course set under our true index and that will give us where it lies on this on these arcs for for speed will be our true airspeed all right so we put our grommet on 140 because we know that's where we're going to end up so now we don't need to slide it we've already slid it to where we need it to be and then under the true index we're going to set it at 310 that's our wind direction and we're doing this so that we can mark our wind speed mark. So we're going to mark 15 knots for our wind speed above our ground speed of 140. Okay, so at 155. Now all we have to do is slide our wheel so that the true index is on our true course of 270. When we do that, our wind velocity mark also slides. Now all we have to do is read off what speed this lies on, on these speed arcs, and that is our true airspeed. Because usually, right, we would slide this wheel so that this mark lines up on our true airspeed, and then we would read off our ground speed. Well, we already know our ground speed, right, is 140, so we've already done that. So now we just need to read off our true airspeed, and if you look, it's just above, two notches above 150, 152 knots for our true airspeed. So now, boom, we have our true airspeed. So now we have our ground speed, we have our true airspeed, and if you remember, we we're going ground speed to true airspeed to indicated airspeed. So now we have, we're on our last step here. And to do that, we need to use the performance side of the E6B. And to do the performance side of the E6B, we're gonna need our pressure altitude, our temperature and our true airspeed. Now the performance side of the E6B converts true airspeed and calibrated airspeed. Um, 
on all these FAA written questions, you're going to assume calibrated airspeed equals indicated airspeed. Now, that is not true 100%. It's off by about 1% or so. Um, but for small and slower aircraft, like the one you'll be training in, it's really small, like I said, 1%, so they assume it's the same. Uh, but once you get to more high-performance aircraft and your speeds increase, this difference is going to change more. It's going to be much more than 1%, and you're going to have to worry about this. But for private pilot FA written questions, calibrated airspeed equals indicated airspeed. So that means when we use our E6B to convert from calibrated airspeed to a true airspeed, we're basically doing indicated airspeed to true airspeed. Okay, so with that out of the way, we know that we can use, we can convert from true airspeed to indicated airspeed using the performance side of E6B. So first in the pressure altitude window, we line up a temperature of negative 10 degrees with our pressure altitude of 8,000 feet, okay? So in this pressure altitude window here, um, line up the eight knot notch with the, the minus 10 notch. Once that's set, all we have to do is read off our indicated airspeed underneath our true airspeed. So our true airspeed is going to be on this outer arc here. And then our indicated airspeed is going to be on this second most outermost arc. Okay. So our true airspeed, we find 152 right here. And we see what that lines up with on the second outermost arc. And it's about 137. So 137 knots indicated airspeed and boom. We have now completed our steps. We've gone from, uh, you know, just a distance and time. Okay, we had a time and distance. We then we got a ground speed. Then we got using our ground speed and our winds and course. We got a true airspeed, and then from true airspeed we got an indicated airspeed. So I hope you guys understood this. If you have any questions whatsoever, uh, comment below, and I will I will uh, do my best to answer. And then um, I don't want you guys to get discouraged about questions like this. This is a very tricky one. But instead, you know, if you're taking this on FA written, skip it, come back to it at the end. And then what I want you to do is just focus on what you know and what you can find with what you know. That usually will start to point you in the right direction, right? So we know time and we had speed. We we're like, okay, well, I can calculate ground speed. So then just do that. Calculate ground speed add it to your list down here like we did here and then say okay now that i have ground speed now what can i do and then you can start to think like well on the wind wind side of the e6b i can get true airspeed knowing uh, my ground speed and winds so okay then go to true airspeed and just sort of work your way step by step uh, using the the procedures that you know the e6b the ground speed equation the fuel consumption equation you know just go step by step and try to work through the problem. This is a tough one. So if you got it, congratulations. Uh, well done. Uh, you really understand these concepts. If not, just keep working. You're going to get it. And ask me questions. That's what I'm here for. So thanks for watching.